What was your motivation to create Codec 2? Well, it, I actually did a PhD in low-rate speech coding in the 1990s and um, did some okay research, but the output wasn't a practical speech codec. Um, other things then distracted me for 10, 15 years, and then Bruce Perens, uh, open source advocate, mm. turned up and said, we need an open-rate speech codec, so it was a chance to um, really use my skills. You know, there aren't many people who can do low bitrate speech coding. Um, dust off my PhD, which everyone always wants to have another crack at, mm. and it was for a, a good cause. Um, there is no open source low-rate speech codec beneath 5,000 bits per second. So something the world needed, uh, in particular the ham community, Absolutely. but many other applications as well. Mm. So where do you see codec 2 being used? Do you think it will end up in telephone systems? Possibly. Um, I initially thought it was mainly digital radio, where bandwidth is at an absolute premium, in particular on HF and VHF. Um, but there are a lot of people keep wanting to use it on VoIP. Um, one of the issues is the packet overheads for VoIP uh, are around 8,000 bits per second per packet. So uh, that's you know ten times the bandwidth of the codec nearly. Um, so there's a inefficiency there. However, you use it for trunking. If you're sending say 32 phone calls from one IP address to another IP address, mm -hmm. then you've still only got that 8,000 bits per second overhead. But you're sending 30 channels. Then it starts to become efficient. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we're getting interest in people using it for um, maritime communications. There's a lot of people, often uh, poor people, who work on ships at sea, want to talk home, and that the only way is through expensive uh, satellite channels. So if you can it, save those few bits per second, it really makes a difference to those guys. Now, yeah. um, we're not mathematicians, but can <laughs> you give us a feeling for how you've been able to turn intelligible speech into an incredibly small amount of data? Yeah, well, Codec 2 uses what's called uh, model-based speech coding. So we construct a model of how the human voice is created, and then we send those model parameters over the channel. Uh, rather than a, a, a high-rate codec like one you might use for MP3s, that looks at the speech at the signal waveform and tries to send the waveform. We don't care about the waveform at all; just the, f the really basic factors that uh, we perceive when we listen to speech. And um, how it works is sort of kind of familiar to a lot of hams, um, it uses a harmonic model of speech. Normally harmonics are a problem, you know, in our transmitter we want to get rid of the third and fifth one, but in mm. that's how speech works. Speech is a harmonic waveform. We have our pitch as the fundamental, and then a bunch of harmonics after that. So at the moment my pitch might be 120 hertz, and what you're also hearing is 240, 360, 480. So what Codec 2 does is works out what that pitch is, and then sends a little bit of information about each harmonic for example, what the amplitude of that harmonic is compared to the previous one. And uh, by sending just those model parameters, you get this, uh, these incredible compression rates uh, compared to a waveform codec. The flip side is it won't send general audio waveforms. So if you try and put music through it, it'll get distorted. Even background noise can be a real problem. And that's something we need to make special care of because you might be using it with, uh, in a car or uh, with a high background noise. So there are, are some issues with low bitrate speech coding. So uh, Codec 2, in terms of radio, is half the story. That gives you a, a, a bit stream. Yes. How do we then modulate that onto a sideband transmitter? Right. Well, the next stage is we need a modem that's capable of sending um, a digital signal over an analog channel, in particular the HF analog channel. And what we do for that is we use something called a multi-tone or parallel tone modem, where we send, uh, instead of one carrier at, say, 1,400 bits per second, we have, uh, I think, 14 carriers each sending two bits in each carrier, um, which ends up at 50 board, which ends up being the 1400 bits per second. And the reason we do that is on a HF channel you have multipath issues. Some of those carriers may get uh, wiped out by multipath interference. And so to avoid losing the whole digital signal, we split them up into multiple carriers so that only part of the signal is uh, corrupted. And is there redundancy? Is there forward error correction? Uh, currently there isn't, but that'll probably be the next step. Um, one of the, the, the idea is that if one of those carriers is removed, you then use forward error correction to correct it. Um, there's two schools of thought. One is we use the human brain to correct it. Mm. It turns out that even if you lose part of the signal, there's still quite a lot left there. And hams in particular, or people who are used to using HF radio, are quite used to pulling l uh, legible speech out of the noise. So the human brain can do a lot of uh, error correction. And the other approach, the more traditional com, you know, communications theory approach, is put a lot of FEC. Um, I'm violently resisting that because I've spent half my life dropping the, the bit rate and uh, people turn around and want to double it for, for, with forward error correction. And, and uh, I guess that also <laughs> slows down the decoding, doesn't it? Um, well, it makes you raise the bit rate a little bit, so it doesn't necessarily slow it down, but it requires an additional bit rate. There's trade-offs there. Sometimes that's worth it. Sometimes there's not. Right. Mm. So for early adopters, uh, what can we do to help you and, and help to make uh, hmm. Vertec 2 and, uh, and the modem work better? Gee, that's a really good question. 
Um, I guess I'm getting a lot of feedback and you know, enthusiastic response from people like yourself, and that really gets me interested. Um, I've had some people send recorded files. Mm-hmm. Uh, I send, um, for example, when I send known data over the channel, I can then measure the channel parameters and uh, modify the modem codec, experiment with FEC. Uh, generally, feedback, I guess, is helpful. Um, if a lot of the coding involved is you know, high-end DSP, which not everyone can do, but if people can program, there's also a lot of just GUI programming, mm-hmm. making buttons appear on the screen. And uh, I've sort of been forced to do that because uh, with another colleague who wrote FreeDV, David Witten, um, because no one else would step up and do it, but obviously it's not the best use of my time. Sure. Yeah, and we have had, having said that, we have had people come up with patches for the Mac and uh, for FreeBSD to get it running. So we're starting to get those sort of feedback. So lots of non-specialised programming and support, uh, you know, make file support, that sort of thing to be done. Right. Yeah. Just one more question. It, it strikes me that the modem alone could be useful as a digital keyboard to keyboard mode. Have you mm. any thoughts about that? Yeah, a couple of people have suggested that just recently on the mailing list, uh, in particular with some FEC. Some early adopters have already tried it. Everything runs on the Linux command line, so they've done things like just catted text files over the, mm. the channel. What it lacks is any sort of ARQ, so if you lose a few bytes, there's no way to retransmit them. Right. Uh, speech, we don't really care if you lose a packet. You certainly don't want to go back and reconstruct it. Right. You're interested in getting the next packet through correctly. How would it compare to PSK31, for example? Uh, it's using PSK uh, already. It's just doing it on 1400 bits per second rather than 31 bits per second. Right. So the signal-to-noise ratio it could operate at would be much higher than PSK31 because the bit rate is much higher. But fundamentally, they both use the same modulation, so they'll have the same bit rate performance. Right. Mm. We even use the very code that they use for the, the side oh, data really? channel. Okay. Yeah, and the author of PSK31 has been very helpful in developing the motor, modem, Peter Martinez Fantastic. from England. Yeah. Is there anything else um, you'd like to say or I should ask you? Uh, I can't think of anything. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much.